witty, thought-provoking, and uplifting Southern Soul Livestream is a program that you'll invite your friends over to watch every week where you'll learn about interesting guests and get to share in their fascinating experiences. Tune in each Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern to connect with guests from across the generations and to laugh with our eclectic hosts who are as charming as they are talented. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's our host, Calvin. OMG, tonight we have one of my favorite persons. I attend her Zoom at noon every Friday because she's always, always, always having fascinating people that I like to get to know and cross prospect, as they say. Tonight we have Dr. Trina Jackson, but tonight she's here for a different purpose, a different role. She will be sharing with us the topic of preserving family history and art. Welcome, Dr. Trina Jackson. Thank you, Calvin. How are you this evening? Great, great, great. So tell us about you. Tell, Tell us about, give us your background what you do and things like that. And then we'll get into the family stuff, right? But let's tell us who you are for the people who had not met you yet. I am the one and only, the fabulous Dr. Trina Lynch Jackson. So I teach at Ivy Tech Community College. I'm over the School of Business, Supply Chain Management and Logistics. I have an interesting background. I spent a little time in the Army So I'm actually a Vietnam era veteran. I was a military police desk sergeant. I transitioned into working in a steel mill for seven years, straight midnights, working on my college degrees. Transitioned into healthcare. I was actually the first woman of color to take over a hospital system. Transitioned into, you notice how I'm saying transitioned into managed care. I did a few years there, worked in a nursing home as a dementia and Alzheimer's director. And after all those years, I transitioned into, and this is what you do, Calvin, my retirement job. So I'm teaching and I'm extremely blessed to be able to do that. But all along that transition, I completed education. I made sure that my employers, and I always tell my students, uh, paid for my education. So I have two associate degrees, a bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, and a doctorate in higher education. My dissertation was actually on veterans transitioning into the community college system because that's in fact what I did. And this evening, I I really want to share the story of my uncle, the late Charles Dean Bugs, who was also a traveler. And our lives, actually, there was some similarity in our lives. I graduated from East Chicago Washington High School, public school system. My uncle graduated from East Chicago Washington along with my father. My uncle was in the military, in the army, just as my father. But my my uncle was an amazing artist. And that's what I want to be able to share with the audience tonight, the importance of celebrating, of recognizing art. And thank you for the trivia because that's extremely important but also celebrating family because we've all been through a difficult time. Many of us have probably lost loved ones based on what's going on. But the most important part of it is celebrating the arts because the arts during these most difficult times suffered because many of us were not able to support the arts. Broadway shut down, movie theaters shut down. But I continue to celebrate and praise the art, especially for my people of color, because it is difficult. So I'm going to pause for a moment and allow you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, you know, for giving us the backdrop. And as you were talking, I knew you had done a lot, but I keep forgetting. I mean, Dr. Jackson, you don't sit still. Good Lord. 
But, you know, bless you and I appreciate you. Tell me this. Tell us about your Uncle Charles, Dean Bugs. What's your earliest memory of him? And then, if you don't mind, tell us how did you get into preserving his art? My uncle always drew. Um, he actually did pencil sketching. So he did that. Um, I'm the first grandchild. So I was considered the first niece. And he, he kind of called me sweetie. His ambition was always to go to Howard University, but he had to work his way through that because he really didn't have the money. So he was a mailman, he worked in the mill, he did everything he could, and his time in the military allowed him to apply for a scholarship at Howard University. He received that scholarship and they were so impressed with his sketchings because he had done that all throughout his travels in life that he started taking classes. And basically what happened is one of the teachers told them, I want people to be able to create masks and you can do that in any way that you want, but I want it to be original. And that's what my uncle started doing. He created masks out of corrugated cardboard, out of um, chip board, and out of, would you believe, paper bags? Paper bags were extremely important. Now the method is called the armature method. And he created these masks. When he graduated from Howard, he started teaching fine arts at the DC high school. So he was there at the DC high school. And based on his perfection of creating these masks, he would visit the museums all the time. And the children's museum found out about what he was doing at the high school. And he eventually became also a curator at the Children's Museum in Washington, DC. And he taught there. But my uncle also, uh-oh, had a love of fishing. He loved fishing. So he spent many years in the DC school system, but then he decided, oh, I'm gonna take a trip to Juneau, Alaska. I just wanna go fishing. He went to Alaska. He found out that there were additional opportunities for him to share the art of mass making. He really loved the culture. He listened to what occurred with individuals, native Alaskans. And he went back to DC. He was able to retire. He loaded up everything. He did the drive. He put his vehicle on what? What did he put his vehicle on? Come on people out here, because you know, Juno is an island. What did he put that vehicle on? Boat? I think Chandra boat. knows the answer. She the put ferry. it in. Well, ferry. Yeah, boat. On the ferry. He put it on the ferry. He ferried it over to Juno. And eventually he got a job, another job, because we're able to do that. When you have your education, it's amazing the things that you can do. And he worked for the state as a mental health worker, but he also started working with the native Alaskan children creating mask. So what I'm going to do for everyone, if it's okay, as he created these masks, he would actually name the mask because he really started studying the African culture as well as the Native American culture and any other culture because he wanted to embrace and understand the story of how masks were actually created. Believe it or not, in the early times, people created masks that were actually, hmm, they look like animals. Why did they do that? Because when they went out hunting, they had to have maybe a bear mask on so that they could, what, trap or kill bears. 
So the story behind a lot of the mask making is interesting, but I'm gonna cover my face with one of the masks because the masks are actually the size of a human head. And I will actually tell you the name of this one before I cover myself. He created this mask in November the 10th of 04. And this is of an African dialect. The name of this mask is Nadaddy. Awesome. Wow. That's very beautiful. Well, again, very intricate as well um, with every single mask. What I have started doing in order to honor my uncle, because when he passed, he decided that he was going to leave everything to the first niece. Um, I would travel to see my uncle. I would have conversations with him as well. And he knew that I would honor and respect, again, all the work that he has done. So I'll show you one more example of a mask. Let's see which one I'll do. Hmm. This is Azteca. So again, it's Azteca. He didn't have a, a date on, well, he has March of 09 on this one. Oh, nice. You know, very different. It's, you know, I'm surprised at how uniquely different each one is. So what I have been doing is I make sure that I show the mask um, because I want to honor him. So this year they were at the Maryville Public Library. I also did a talk, um, it's called Art on the Air. So I was featured on Art on the Air and I talked about my uncle and, and the things that he has done. His artwork has been on display at the Juno library and also at the Mendenhall uh, library. And again, that's in Juneau, Alaska. Now I've been traveling back and forth based on that inheritance. And it's important that we respect inherited wealth and we honor generational wealth as well. That's important. So I'm making sure that I do that um, with my two grandchildren. He created a workbook. The workbook is actually called The Art of the Paper Mask. What I'm working on, is I actually have to rewrite the intro for this workbook. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur, so I believe in generating money as well because I want to be able to continue and be able to share his story. He did a video of actually creating the mask as well because he says to create a mask, it's almost like a baseball mitt. That's how you create it. And you're making that circle. So what I'm trying to do is I'm going to, the videotape that he made, I'm going to make that into a DVD. I'm going to post it on YouTube. And again, it's actually a form of generating what? And this is what I tell all of my students about being entre entrepreneurs, being innovative. But again, my responsibility is to honor my family. I wanna share one more story because I don't wanna get in trouble with time, Calvin, because I wanna respect time as well. I just wanna share a story and it's titled The Suitcase. And it's actually based on my uncle. I wrote a book called Caution, This May Hurt, your feelings. Now this book talks about, again, racial disparities, short stories on things that have occurred. Um, my truth, I'm telling my truth as it relates to, to race and some of the many issues that have occurred. But the suitcase is actually about my uncle. And my uncle, I did not know was preparing me for his death. So when I would travel and have conversations with him, he would take me to the bank in Juneau and have me sign papers. And I really didn't understand what was going on. But at some point he said, what little I have, sweetie, I, I want you to have because I know you will honor and respect that. But again, I didn't realize what was going on. 
I didn't realize that he was placing letters that I wrote him in a suitcase. I didn't realize that he was trying to prepare me ultimately for his transition. And it was important that I respect that. But a conversation I had with him, I always noticed this little cough. And I'd say, uncle, what's, what's going on with that cough? And he'd say, oh, sweetie, it's just, you know, I've got a little cold. That's all I have. And I said, okay. But when I visited him one year, he was frail and I could hear that, that cough. But I didn't understand. So that time we rode all around the island and I kind of gave you a little on this. He had me pulling wildflowers and he, I helped him plant a rock garden outside of the condo unit that I eventually inherited. I had a few conversations and at one point I could hear that, that cough, that rattle. And I weeped because I knew, I knew something was going on. And he heard that and he said, you know what? I don't wanna talk anymore, I'll, I'll talk to you later. But the neighbors called me two days after that and said, I don't hear your uncle Charlie moving around in the condo. I called the Juno Police Department. They went to the condo and he had passed the way he wanted to. Because I wanna share with everyone, it's extremely important that we respect last wishes. And he had told me that he had had lung cancer, and that he had had a wonderful life, 77 years. Wow. When he went to Howard, he saw Felicia Rashad. He saw Roberta Flack as a child playing the piano in the conservatory. But I had to understand and respect that. From, some, from that suitcase, everything was in a briefcase. And when I went to the condo, everything was in there that I needed because again, he was preparing me. And now I have that briefcase and I also have a briefcase and that's for my grandchildren. Because when my uncle passed in October, I didn't realize that my only child was gonna pass that same year in December. But again, he was preparing me and I'm a person of faith and I'm extremely thankful that he prepared me. And I want my listening audience to understand how important it is to prepare and to cherish and to honor. And I so appreciate you, Calvin, allowing me the opportunity to share my story. And I'm gonna show you a final mask and this mask is important simply because in the Hispanic culture, they celebrate the Day of the Dead. And for people of color, we celebrate when individuals pass on because we want to cherish and honor their lives. So with that, I'm going to show you actually the Day of the Dead. Awesome. Wow. Very beautiful. Okay, Calvin, no, I left you, I, I you, left you a little yes. breathless there. You were kind of, you were, you were pausing, Calvin. Yes, 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 pause. thank you. I know I've seen pictures, but you, 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 you keep the best, right? And you, I can only imagine. Thank you for sharing your story. You know, one thing I love about, as you speak, and as I heard Chandra speak last week on your show, and make sure you drop in your Zoom in noon in the chat when you get a chance, is that you guys are awesome at the digital storytelling. And the digital storytelling of documenting our history, our legacy, and honoring those that came before us. I'm looking forward to, I'm going to reach out to Chandra and have her on the show pretty soon. Because what I love is she was talking about entrepreneurship. But all oh, that digital storytelling is so, so strong. So thank you, Dr. Trina Jackson, for being here tonight and sharing your story. And I look forward to working with you again soon. Thank you. Awesome. So people, now we're going to transition to our 
second feature, our key feature for tonight. And, you know, I'm excited because for this lady, Miss Stephanie James, we've had the opportunity to kind of chat and chop it up and just talk about some awesome things. But you know, the funny thing is, as I'm preparing for the show, I'm talking to people and they're like, man, we got to get on the show. We need to hear how in the world did this lady quit her job? And she out there, I don't know, she in Tokyo, she in, you know, uh, Budapest. I mean, Stephanie, how are you doing? Hi, everyone. I can't <laughs> see everyone, so it's weird. I'm just, like, looking at myself, but um, hopefully everybody's feeling good tonight. Um, I'm doing well. I can't complain. Awesome, awesome. Well, T Stephanie, let's just get started with you. Tell us about uh -huh. you, your origin story, your career. Give us a backdrop of who this person is. We're going to get into the travel, but we always like to get to know, like, who you are. Like, where did you originate from? What's your story? I mean, where did you grow up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was I was born in Germany, and my dad was in the in the military, so I was born on a American uh, German military base. Um, I, my grandmother is from France, and I love Spanish and speak Spanish, so I'm just confused actually. But <laughs> no, I'm I'm from I was born in Germany, but we went to Colorado Springs afterwards. So I actually grew up in Colorado Springs. Um, there are black people there. I am proof of that. And, uh, maybe not as much as the East coast, but every time I stand from Colorado, everybody says, Oh, there's black people in Colorado. Like, yep. There's, there's a few of us a little bit more than we get credit for with the air force Academy and huge army base and, uh, Olympic training center and some of the stuff out there. But that's where I'm from. I went to Hampton university, played basketball all four years. Um, when I was a senior, I majored in uh, public relations. I changed my major three times. So I was sports management, business management, jumped to public relations. And uh, senior year, my professor said, hey, you should apply for this internship in China. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, that would be great. But it looks like the deadline already passed. And he was like, well, you should write the, write the acceptance, write them anyways, right? Do it anyways. Um, so I wrote them and she was like, hey, can you can you fly to New York? Can you fly to Rockefeller to interview? I'm like, so I'm a college student with minimal funds. You want me to fly to New York um, to interview for a potential unpaid internship? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> so that's what I did. I, I flew to New York and got the, got the internship. And um, that's kind of where the travel bug began is with the... Um, seeing China, see Beijing was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And that's, that's where it all started. So I was there for a month and got to um, meet with the, all the fun. I mean, Serena Williams, five of Phelps, eight wins, see the men's basketball team, women's basketball team, you name it. It was incredible. Um, then I came back, I started working for a fortune 50 company for eight years and just still had that travel book, wanted to see the world and wanted to see more of the world. So I did a little bit. I went to Greece, went to Italy, and then I kind of got to a point where I wanted to just travel full time. So I started looking for ways to to make that happen. So, You know, what I love about your story is the fact that you actually did the corporate thing, right? Because initially yeah. people were thinking like, ah, oh, maybe, you know, she, you know, she just never worked. But you actually did the corporate job, right? Were you like on the fast track, as they would say, you know, making a lot of money? Did you live that life? I did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened? That, I'm, I'm, I'm just so track. curious. Yeah. What happened, right? You were like, there's not enough yeah. money. Somebody, you know, um, got you upset. I mean, what happened when you had that no. aha moment? Please tell me the story. Yeah, no, none of those things, actually. I mean, the, the company was fantastic. I was on the fast track. I was promoted four times in eight years. They were like, we see you on the national platform. You're going to do amazing things for, you know, our company. And, and I, I loved it. I actually enjoyed um, my eight years at the, at the organization. I just wanted to travel. So there was nothing wrong. There was nothing bad. It just, I felt like if I didn't go at that point, I wouldn't go, right? And I have kids, I wasn't dating. I was like, I probably should go. Luckily I went before the pandemic, all right? Um, but yeah, I like that about my story too, that I worked at a Fortune 50 because some, I always tell people that 
you have to take a leap of faith. You have to take that jump, but it has to be a calculated jump. You have to plan for it. It wasn't like people just started seeing travel posts and videos and they're like, oh, this, you know, she's, how is she doing these things? Like, oh, I worked for eight years and saved. And it was a very calculated jump. I knew that when I jumped, when I landed, I, I wouldn't be in shallow waters. I knew that, um, I didn't know everything, but I, I at least planned to take, to take that leap. And I think that's a very important element that sometimes we miss. Um, awesome. Life. I can appreciate that. Tell me this, what is your favorite part about traveling? Like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I love traveling. I'm like, I'm more of a, what is it? I like a road trip, right? I'm a road trip person. Okay. I get in the car. Okay. I don't know. I'll drive for 10, 20 hours. It just relaxes me, right? I mean, what's your thing? What, mm -hmm. What's your, you know, favorite thing about traveling? My favorite thing about traveling is the people, right? Meeting different people around the world and, and, and gaining a different perspective. I think travel is like the best life coach. It is the best life coach that you can have. Um, even if you're staying local, if you're traveling domestically, you're taking a road trip, you go somewhere different, you're going to learn something new. So, you know, meeting new people, also the, experiencing the culture. Um, if you look at, if you watch Encanto recently, which is a fantastic animated film, the, the details of that film were so rich um, from her earrings to what she was wearing to her shoes to they had the Sancocho, which is uh, traditional um, dish in Colombia. They had buñuelo. They, I mean, just the details of it. And I think that's what I love so much about travel is the richness in our differences and, and how much our differences are actually similarities as well. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely love culture, even though I've mostly stayed here within the States. I often tell mm -hmm. people, if you go two hours down the street <clears throat> um, highway, that you will see culture very differently. Um, how mm -hmm. about you? Favorite destinations? Any favorite places you travel? You know, I get that question all the time, and and it's it's it is tough to say a favorite place overall because I like everywhere for different things. So okay. you'd have to say like, what's your favorite country for outdoors? Right, Ecuador is amazing. What's your favorite country for food and people? Thailand. The food, the people are so wonderful. Like their initial disposition is to smile. You know, just like the moment they see you, they're just smiling at you. Um, but that's that's kind of how I typically answer the question is depending on what somebody wants to know. It has to be for a specific thing because I did enjoy every country for something different. So 38 countries. How did you how did you decide on 38 countries? Do you just randomly wake up and you choose a destination? <laughs> do you do based on safety? Because I'll tell you why. There are people listening now and they've taken a different approach. You know, they worked hard. They're getting to the point where they're either retired or getting ready to retire. And like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I think it's time for me to go out there and travel mm -hmm. the world. I mean, any recommendations or thoughts for those people, any places they should go? Because some people could be like, is it safe? Is it not? But obviously you're a woman, right? You travel. I take it you're mm -hmm. probably traveling most of the time, you know, um, by yourself. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. You know, for people who are just getting started to really step out on this thing that you've been doing. Yeah, one thing I would say is that if you're traveling by yourself, you're never truly alone. You know, you meet people along the way. Um, I never tell anybody I'm alone if I'm alone. I'm like, oh, yeah, my big burly boyfriend is in the back. <laughs> Just don't, you know, I never tell anybody that I'm by myself when I'm by myself. Um, so that's one thing I would say. I think a lot of research is important. Um, and then figuring out what type of traveler you are. I have friends who live in vans. I have friends who... I was more of like, I would stay for a month or two and then go to another country, stay for a month or two, go to another country. I have friends who like to stay in a place for one year and really like put their roots down. So they want to go to a place, get an apartment and really enjoy living there, you know, immersing themselves in the culture. So the first thing that I would recommend is like trying a, a bunch of different things and seeing what type of traveler you are and then being able to honor yourself in that way. Um, do a lot of research within the Airbnb. If you're going to go that route, uh, making sure you're near a metro station, a bus, making sure you're near a grocery store, you're near a gym, make sure, making sure you're near the things that are going to make your new location feel like home, whatever that looks like for you um, is really important. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to leave some of the questions for the Q&A because I know the audience got a bunch of okay. direct questions. I probably put them in the chat now. Right. So in the end, we're going to definitely do an open forum. 
Tell me about this. Before we get into that, let's talk about your travel show. I love this part, right? So you're traveling, mm-hmm. you're yeah. living your best life, you know, living it like yes. it's golden, <laughs> stolen. You decide, hey, I'm going to produce a travel show. And I'm like, first of all, who does yeah. that? But you do it. But, you know, <laughs> but you have your website on here, Just a Vessel Poetry. So there's a lot about you yeah. that I just realized you hadn't told. But I'm just really curious. How did you get ah. to the point where you're like, you're going to do a travel show. What is that about? What does it even mean? Tell us about changing tourism. Yeah. So there's a couple of pivots there, right? So basketball was my first love. I was going to be the first girl in the NBA. Then when the WNBA came out, I was going to, that was definitely for me. And I played basketball Hampton, you know, had an agent. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I love basketball. Right. And I had plantar fasciitis. So it wasn't something that I could make a career, unfortunately. Um, so I pivoted, and one of the pivots was poetry. So I'm actually an international poet and, and singer. I've serenaded over 80 weddings. Um, I've performed on over 300 stages internationally doing poetry. I have two albums of poetry and song. So that was like the first pivot. Um, and then the next pivot was traveling. And I mixed the two. So I took all of my, I took both of my albums around the world. I had a kind of competition with myself to see if I could perform in every country that I lived in. So I was able to do that as well, which was really cool. Um, And then the pivot was traveling. So, so the show, so changing tourism is the concept of it is to highlight the black indigenous people of color in different countries around the world and give them a platform, give them a platform to tell stories that would otherwise remain untold. Um, We don't really see a big there's a big market of black travelers on Instagram and on social media, but you're not seeing it as much on television, right? So that was the idea to take it to a more formalized and accessible um, fashion and shape it in that way. Uh, So it's gonna be kind of a culmination. I would love to interview locals. I love to interview artists in different locations, um, highlight BIPOC shops, BIPOC restaurants, um, do some adventures that are happening in the different different towns. I mean, you name it, I've done it. I have zero desire to ever bungee jump, but just about everything else I've done. Um, jumping out of a perfectly good plane. <laughs> you name it, I've, I've probably done it. So mixing some adventures, some, some interviews with the locals, their shops, their restaurants. Um, and then obviously I want to have an element of giving back as well, and which I think would be a different spin to, to, to the show. So, you yeah. know, that is so... Beautiful. And I read that part of your story, but I'm now just reminded, like you said, you know, there are people like you who are connected on Instagram and various social media. So, you know, each other, right? It's a small circle. It's a one hashtag yeah. away. However, we mm-hmm. don't see it on TV. And like you right. just said, we do not see those beautiful people, those awesome experiences of people you come in contact with. Right. OMG. What would it look like if we log <laughs> on to change in tourism and we see Stephanie and she's talking to these salt of the earth people that look like us, that feel like us, but they're halfway around the globe. And you think and you feel like that's your cousin. Right. I mean, that's beautiful. Is that the inspiration behind it? Because, you know, I'm just getting excited, you know, thinking about it. Right. Is, yeah. is, is, is that the excitement? Your, what, what's I your goal? Your like? That is definitely the goal. That is definitely the goal to to bring those spaces, to make them more tangible, right? You hear all the time, like, oh, man, I want to do what you're doing. I would love to do what you do, but I have to do this or I have this um, this responsibility, this, you know, obligation. So to bring a little bit of, so I want to share. I want to share my experiences and that this was the way that I wanted to to share them. Awesome. That is beautiful. Let's see here. I think we should go to q and A. I'm thinking, let me see if I got any more questions. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I have any more questions that I wanted to ask, okay. but go ahead. I, I skipped over some other things. What about yourself would you like to tell people? Because I know the audience has tons of questions, but mm-hmm. anything else you want to tell the people before we go to Q&A? Not really. Definitely connect with me, right? Connect with me, Just a Vessel 22. Um, on all the social medias, Just a Vessel 22 and Just a Vessel Poetry.com. I would love to stay connected to everybody and thank you for, for tuning in. 
Awesome, awesome. awesome. Well, we're, it, we're not over yet. I just know for the audience, we got some <laughs> questions, and I don't want them to be mad at me because they will text me and be like, well, you didn't let me ask Uh-oh. my question. So so that's <laughs> I'm trying to stay out of trouble. So let's go Uh-oh. to the audience. Um, Tamika, Katie, what do you got in the chat? Anyone have any questions? I see the chat is definitely full, but who has some verbal questions they want to speak out? Oh, we can do some um, some type questions. And I'm going right, to change. Right now, no one's put a question in, which I'm surprised. But oh, uh, Timothy j- did say his retirement job, he wants to be an author and create a brand as the beach author, mm. where he travels across the world mm. and writes books from the beach. And I think that's kind of amazing. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, oh, there that is That sounds incredible, actually. There is a question. I see you, Dr. Jackson. Um, Donna put a question in the chat. Do you ever host group trips? I don't. I've gotten a lot of requests about potentially doing that. I haven't done it. Uh, I drive myself crazy, like planning my own travel. So I just think when I think about planning it for multiple people, I'm just like, oh, my God. I know it would be amazing if I did it. Trust me. Um, but I don't love to do it even for myself. I think if I can get past that portion of it, I would love to do that. So I can see once Changing Tourism is in full production, potentially hosting a group trip some or group trips in the future, for sure. I, I, I feel it coming. Something tells me demand is going to be like, <laughs> come on, Stephanie, come on, Stephanie. You know, probably know. when you got 200 people saying, come on, Stephanie, we've been asking you forever. Um, there's some more questions. I, I see um, Dr. Jackson. <laughs> Uh, please connect with me when you have an opportunity, because again, I have that condo in Juno. I only travel okay. there twice twice a year, and if you want to spend a little time there, you know, interviewing, sharing your gifts, I can connect you with the Juno Art, and you can do some things there. So, Calvin, make That's sure awesome. she connects with me, and um, yeah. you might want to spend two months. You might want to spend three months in Juno. Um, but please connect with okay. me. And that's what Calvin and I are, are about. Mm. We're about connecting, um, sharing, um, because this is what we do. Awesome. Yes. Dr. Jackson that's is awesome. the yeah, ultimate great. networker. <laughs> and she also connects, right? People be networking, but they don't be connecting. You know, it's a difference. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing I appreciate about Dr. Jackson. Chandra has a hand up. Chandra, what question do you have? Not a question, just a comment, because I I love traveling and I love seeing people that look like me that love to travel, because we know there are some people, unfortunately, that they haven't even been out of their own city, much less the state. Yeah. And for you to go and to do all that, I just I commend you. And um, I love to go on cruise trips, cruise ships. I love cruising. That's what I enjoy doing. But I just I just celebrate. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, and I apologize, I had to step away for a moment. My mother called, so I missed part of your conversation, but I don't know if you, um, mm-hmm. with your website, if you um, blog or monetize anything, but you may be able to, in fact, do some free traveling, you know, as far as if you give Absolutely. reviews and things like that. So I'd love to connect with you as well. Calvin has my information. Yes, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll Calvin, definitely... you, got, you got to send me all this information now. Yes, I'll, I'll definitely um, make sure it's shared. And thank you. Um, let's see who else we got here. I got, to, I see the travel extraordinaire, Miss Lauren. She never wants to get on the microphone, but I know she has questions. Lauren, what questions do you have? How about that? While we wait for other people to think about the questions, I do have some more questions because, you know, I skipped through it because I was enjoying the conversation so much. You know, one thing I enjoy about, and I did some reading before, uh, the show and I began to look at travel and I looked at, you know, certain perspectives. They talked about how, You know, at times, you know, there's certain people who, you know, um, we may have certain global perspectives of. I mean, we don't have to, we we live in America, we know, right? In global perspectives where people are like, oh, we saw you on TV, don't you act like this? But, you know, have you had any of those experiences where you've traveled to a place and, you know, you experienced the local culture and discovered it was very, very different from, you know, what was being described? I say all that to say, you know, how has, you know, your travel influenced? your global perspective. And I'm hoping you probably had, you know, some experiences or some examples you can share with us. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, Yeah, everything that I think about a place is wrong. Everything, (laughs) literally everything. I mean, 
I lived in London for a year and a half, and I, I knew they had double-decker red buses and black taxis, and it felt very Oliver Twist-ish with the street lights. Uh, but I had no idea that it was like a mini Jamaica, right? Given the the windrush was similar to slavery in the states, and then bringing us to the East Coast, that's what they did with the windrush, and the Jamaicans went to London and to to England, um, and so. I didn't expect to go to London and, and see so many Jamaicans and be able to get oxtail on any corner, which was actually fantastic. Um, but to answer your question, any anywhere, any assumption or my own perspective that I have prior to going to a place is always proven wrong. And I actually love that about about traveling because I don't go in, you know, I mean, there's always, you're always going to have preconceived notions of how you think of places. Um, and it's just beautiful. It's beautiful when it's different than what you anticipate it, but it's still amazing in its own way. And that's typically what happens to me in my travels. Yeah, I, I love that. You say whatever, whatever preconceived notion you have, it's almost like you go in with the yeah. expectation that it's going to change, <laughs> right? That's, that's actually mm -hmm. pretty cool. So it's all kinds of surprises. You said something earlier about researching the place that you go to. It, it gave me more questions. Like me, I'm in the States. I'm like, okay, I'm going to a city. Is there a Starbucks? Yeah. But you can't really do that globally, can you? Do you look for a Starbucks? <laughs> like, how do you, like, what type of research do yeah, you do? They have Starbucks. They have Starbucks overseas. Um, it's not not necessarily the, yeah, you can research restaurants. You can research, you, and, and a lot of people research in different ways. Some people love to go on Instagram and see what's going on in a, in a town. Some people like to Google. Some people like to go on different um, magazines or blog posts or watch YouTube videos to get there. Like there's so many different facets and platforms that you can use to research uh, where you're going to next. And once again, it's all dependent on what you want to do. If my mom's coming with me, I got to find all of the yarn store, the, all of the yarn stores within a 50 mile radius, right? For her. Um, if I'm going with another friend, we need to go to all the art galleries that are that are out there so it just depends on what your interests are but really looking in like i said you can use youtube you can use instagram you can use facebook groups uh, they have expat groups of people that have been living in these cities and they have great advice to give when you say hey i'm coming to town what do you guys recommend or you can be like calvin and look for starbucks in mexico city and you may just find it if you ask <laughs> so yes i will definitely be looking for starbucks because as you can imagine, they only put Starbucks in a few locations. So let's see here. Did we get any more questions from we the audience? We did. We got a lot more questions now. Um, from Tamla, she wants to know what cultural uniqueness that you experienced wowed you. Mm. Cultural uniqueness that I experienced that wowed me. Oh, my gosh. So many things. I would say... Oof. One of them that comes to mind is when I lived in Japan, when I was living in Tokyo, um, they are very like militant and it's, it's scary. It's, it's a, like one of the biggest cities in the world and they're just so structured. Like when you get off the train, everybody waits to get off the train and then they all go in a single file line up this. I mean, you can eat off the streets. It's very quiet. You can hear a pin drop on their Metro and these are, hundreds of people in, in one location and just the the way that they operate is very interesting. It was unlike something that I've seen. Um, and then on the inverse, Vietnam was insane. <laughs> it was insane. There's no rules. You cannot drive there even if you wanted to. They have no rules. You can literally, I went for a run one morning. I saw a chicken being defeathered. I saw I mean, you, you're, it's, it's literally like sensory overload when you go there. You're every, all of your senses are going crazy at all times when you step outside. In, in Ho, this is Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Um, but there's, there's been a lot of cultural differences that, that you, some you acclimate to and some you just realize like, okay, I'm definitely different than, than, these, than these people and they know it. Like they know I stick out like a sore thumb here. Um, one cool thing was there's a there's a group in Colombia that I will feature in in the pilot episode of Changing Tourism called Afro Sunidos, and it is a it's a black group of Afro Colombians that 
that join with African Americans. And we, I went to a party one time or like a networking event and I couldn't tell like who was African American or who was Afro Colombian until I spoke to them. And I was like, oh yeah, she's definitely American. I'd go speak to her and she'd be like, oh, no sé, no habla de And then I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't know what, what is happening? Um, so there's definitely been, I can tell you that. I can, there's a million stories I could share all day about cultural differences that, that really made me open my eyes wide. Like, oh my goodness. And the more you know, the more you feel you don't know. Awesome. I see Lauren has her hand up. Lauren London. Go ahead, Lauren. You can take yourself off me. Thanks, Kelvin. Uh, Stephanie, it's great to hear your story. Um, I love what I'm hearing. I love what you said about London and you thought it was very Oliver Twisty mm. and then you learned. And, and I think, you know, um, hearing your stories of, of your travel and, and just how much you're, you're learning um, is, is amazing. It's very inspiring. Um, I, w I was going to ask about... Um, how do you conquer, or have you conquered your your bravery? Um, because particularly when you're traveling solo, I know you've said you're connected with some expat groups, but um, mm -hmm. do you ever kind of have a fear of, um, you know, uh, of you know being alone and not having anyone there to, to kind of call on if uh, if there was a threat? Mm -hmm. Uh, not really, to be honest, because I don't like. I, I mean, I'm not shy, as you as you all can probably gather. Um, so I'm not alone for long. Like wherever I go, I'm not alone for long. Um, and then it went, the places where I was alone for a little bit longer than most, I make sure that I like. You want to make sure you locate the U.S. embassy or the U.K. embassy. You want to make sure that you have like you know the emergency contact number. You want to make sure that. Your phone is working over there, whether you use Google Fi or you can get a SIM card in that country, but you know, those types of things. So though I might physically be alone, I never felt fully alone, right? I could always make a call or I knew where certain things were, or I would make a friend with a neighbor just to have some, like, hey, if you don't see me come back at like seven, please uh, call my mom, <laughs> you know? So you just set up, set up a couple things in place to make sure that, that, you're, that you feel secure, whatever that looks like for you. But for me, it was also staying near um, well-lit areas. So I did a lot of research to make sure, and I would talk to the host. I, I, I typically stayed, used Airbnbs for my stays, and I would talk to them about the Wi-Fi connection and the lighting and how close is it to this? and you know, I would make sure it was pretty centrally located so that I didn't, I wasn't in some, you know, far out farm, you know, little house on the prairie destination where nobody would hear me if something, if something went, went on. So, um, yeah, I think it's putting all those things in place, but I, I never felt, I've been, in all of my travels, there was only one time that I felt a little bit afraid and I was in, I was in Portugal and there was like a guy following me and I don't know what his intentions were. It was an older man, but I was just like, I don't know. I just thought he had somebody waiting in, in the alley to grab me or something. He was following me for like 30, 40 minutes. And then when I kind of realized it, I like mixed in with a group of students and ran the other, like in a different direction. But that's like the only time in my travels that I've felt very like afraid about for my safety, right? Yeah, something tells me, um, Stephanie, that you are an expert traveler. I think you got intuition on top of intuition. <laughs> and Yeah, you have to be very alert. Way, way more alert than I am in Maryland. Unless I'm in Baltimore, then I'm very alert as well. <laughs> I'm thinking about your um, your mother, though. You mentioned your mother. I mean, is she, like, cool yeah. with this after all of these years? Because it sounds like what you've been doing about what, five, ten years or whatever. It seems like at this point, mom's like, that's my daughter. I mean... What's going on there? Yeah, she's definitely that person. I mean, I was that child, right? I was the one jumping from the top of the stairs with 15 flight stairs and just breaking my elbow and places that you sh are really hard to break from it. Like, so she's like, yeah, this is, this is who she is. Um, she's joins in on the fun. I've talked to her. She can't swim. And I've talked her into, she, uh, parasailed with me in Jamaica and, um, she came to Thailand actually with me and we went snorkeling she she almost drowned me the whole time but she got in the water <laughs> she she had a good time um but yeah she's definitely that mother that's like this is what she's gonna do I was, she's a praying mother so that's helpful um 
yeah, she joins in on the fun now, though. She she joins in on my crazy, so I like it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Just uh, let's just take one, two more questions. What do you have, right. um, Tamika? So from Erica, I know she's a fellow traveler. Um, she wanted to know uh, how has the pandemic kind of uh, changed your travel? Have you had to make any major changes to where you travel or how you travel since then? Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, I'm based in Maryland right now. I mean, I haven't been in the States this long since 2016. So it's definitely changed. Um, I was, I was, I did not sit still for like four years and then the pandemic happened. So that if that gives you any perspective on on the change um but i'm very grateful for the stillness i like having a couch you know, like i lived out of my suitcase and a backpack for four years um so it's kind of nice to actually have a couch and, and in my own bed in my you know like obviously i had all those things before but to have your own place is, is nice i don't actually think I'll, I'll ever not have a base again of my own so, because i actually really enjoy having a place to call home um, but yeah, to answer her question, I, I'm grateful for the stillness because it's allowed me to, it, it, it allowed me to birth changing tourism it, that it, it made me sit still long enough to say, what is your next pivot? And, and I don't know that I would have done that had I been moving, 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 moving. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Stephanie, thank you for being here tonight. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, um, with us, your experiences, which are just inspirational. And they're inspirational for different reasons, but knowing the audience here at Southern Soul, we just have literally each generation. And as you can imagine, mm. from, you know, early 20s to, you know, late 70s, we have the whole generation. So each person hears your story through, you know, a different lens. So and I guarantee you it's inspirational no matter which decade or generation is hearing. I look forward to, you know, working with you more. I'm going to share that information with you and connect you with Chandra and Dr. Jackson. So thank you for being here. People, what I would like to do. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. Anything else? Any any shout outs? Anything else before? So feel free to hang out. We're going to no, um, no, talk no, to Erica. The best of and, just the best of um, 22. Please connect with me. Yes, we'll definitely connect you. So what I wanted to do, people, one last thing before we let you go is that for Women's History Month, I definitely wanted to make sure that we get a chance to spotlight women entrepreneurs. As you can imagine, we had Stephanie. She's doing her entrepreneurial thing. We still got to get out of her when that show is coming out because she didn't tell us that. So hopefully we'll get that soon. And we had Dr. Trina Jackson, who is an entrepreneur connector, but I wanted to make sure that we spotlight another entrepreneur and we wanted to give Erica, you know, five minutes to tell us about who she is and what she does. Well, hello everyone. Stephanie, that was awesome. We have so many things in common. Um, I am Erica Chisholm and um, thank you, Calvin and Tamika for inviting me. So a little bit about my background. I have just left corporate America after 27 years. I am an army, army brat and I went to high school. Now my dog wants to, he's been quiet this whole time. Now he wants to participate. But um, I, went to, I went to high school with Tamika in Germany and pre-pandemic, I traveled a lot. Um, I probably traveled out of the country four times a year. So not as much as you, Stephanie, but it was quite a bit. I have two continents left to um, go to. I was uh, My friends and I were working on an expedition to Antarctica before the pandemic. So now I just have Antarctica and Australia to go to. And so when I left corporate America, I um, started two different businesses. And so I've only been gone for about three years, excuse me, three months. And with that, I have a consulting, business consulting firm where I handle supply chain solutions, um, nonprofits, security, and HR. And then I started Diva's Prerogative as well. So with Diva's Prerogative, right now I'm focusing um, on women, um, women's lifestyle brands. And 
right now, specifically, I am working on um, a travel line, but the products that I have on my site are passport covers because again, I love to travel. And I noticed that when traveling, I never saw passport covers that reflected um, people of color. So that is what my goal is. And I have some, I'm gonna try to see if I can show you a few of them um, with my, I may have to hold on one second. I'm gonna take my background down. Abby, can you show me the screen or I wanna- Yeah, see yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, let's okay. see, uh, let me hit that button. Let's see. There you go. Thank Wait. you. Thank uh, you. Actually, she's on a different screen. Okay. But, okay, go ahead, yeah. But, so I made covers again to represent people of color. And these covers are um, vaccination card holders as well, so that you will have all of these spaces that you need when you are traveling. I know some people have the vaccination covers electronically now, but these are um, very useful as well because you have everything you need. So over the next month, I will be um, starting my travel line, which has will have luggage covers, luggage, um, travel bags, um, neck pull pillows. I'm currently selling on Etsy, but I will have my website up and running. So that's a little bit about me, about, um, about my businesses. And uh, thank you for the time. Thank you, Erica. And Tamika, drop your um, website in the your SD in the chat. I'm going to make sure that Stephanie also um, gets your information. People, it has been awesome tonight. Thank you for your patience as we do our double feature. OMG, we've had some awesome stories between Dr. Trina Jackson sharing that beautiful story of curating family art and history with Stephanie just giving us a look into her lens and being our eyes as she travels the world and sees various experiences in various culture and helping us think about how we can one day travel in such a free way. Thank you for joining us at Southern Soul Livestream Talk Show. Join us weekly at soullivestream.com. If you're joining us live, we'll take a quick music break and then come back for a discussion with the audience.